What I want to cover in this episode is identification, authorization, and authentication. The challenge we have is that, well, computers aren't people. Uh, I can't go up to a lady in a ticket booth and just show them a driver's license or a confirmation number and, in essence, get my tickets. Instead, what we do is we have what are called authentication factors. Now, there are three big authentication factors. The first one is something you know. And that's something like a password, for example, would be something you know. The next one is something you have. And that means things like a smart card or something that you actually have on your person that you can use to authorize you. And the last one is something about you. And that's what we call biometrics. That's going to be things like retinal scanners and things that actually measure the veins in your palm, all kinds of cool stuff like that. Anyway, let's go ahead and start with the first one, and that is something you know. So the best example is good old passwords. So here we are at a typical login screen, and you can see that I have my username that I type in and my passwords. We're all pretty comfortable with something like that. But passwords aren't the only type of something you know. Another great example are going to be PIN codes. Now, we see pins all over the place. One of my favorite ones is here on my phone right here. So what I'm going to do is, uh, you guys are going to fuzz all this out, right? OK, so what I'm going to do is punch in my password. One, two, three, four. It's not a password, Mike. It's a pin. Yeah, I know. It's OK. Oh, it's incorrect. Like I was really going to let you guys see my pin code? Come on. Now, we see pins all over the place. Uh, we see them on phones a lot, uh, ATM machines. But again, that's a great example of something you know. Uh, in fact, it, for certain uh, Department of Justice folks I work with, not only when you walk up to a machine do you have to type in a password, but you actually have to type in a pin separately, depending on what type of authenticating system you might have. But that's not the only types of something you know. There's two more I want to look at. First of all, let's take a look at CAPTCHA. We've probably all seen a CAPTCHA screen. Most of the time, these tend to pop up like on websites where you're logging in uh, a few too many times and you're making the authenticating process a little bit nervous. So what they're going to do is they're going to let you type in your username and password again, but you're going to have to type in the CAPTCHA. You know what that CAPTCHA says. The idea here is that it's preventing evil computer programs that can just keep logging in over and over again from being able to log in. So that's CAPTCHA. Now the last one I want to take a look at is right here. And this is going to be security questions. There's a good chance most of us have seen security questions too. Security questions usually pop up, for example, when you've forgotten your password or something like this. And it allows for an automatic password retrieval type system simply by you remembering the name of your first dog or your mother's maiden name or your school that you graduated from, whatever it might be. OK, the next one is something you have. Now, this is a very typical smart card that you'll see used in like a lot of federal organizations and stuff like that. The important thing about a smart card is embedded somewhere on that smart card is a chip that holds a unique identifying code. And when you insert this or when you wave it over a sensor or whatever it might be, it provides that code to the authenticating body. Now, smart cards are great, but the last one I want to show you is known as an RSA key. Now, an RSA key, it can be a little device that has got a number, or it can be a piece of software. And I actually have one here, so let me show you how an RSA key works. Now, I want you to watch this very closely. You'll see this eight-digit code? Watch. OK, you see it just change? An RSA token, or an RSA key, is a piece of software or a, an actual physical key you can get that stores a secret code of some form. It then takes that secret code and performs some magic little voodoo on it and will generate a value that changes, it depends, there's no law of physics, every 30 seconds, every 60 seconds. So the only way that another device can authenticate this is that if it also has that secret code, and it will go ahead and run the same mumbo jumbo. And if it comes up with the same value, you are in good shape. Now, the last one is something about you. 
And when we talk about something about you, we're talking about something about you physically. So we could have fingerprint scanners or iris patterns or even the pattern of the veins in your wrist can be used to identify you uniquely. Now there are two more we need to talk about. One of them is called something you do. And when we talk about something you do, there are actually authentication programs like where if you log in your password, for example, not only do you have to have the right password, but literally the rhythm of your typing can be used to verify that it's actually your kind of typing style, which is pretty cool. Now the last one I want to talk about is called somewhere you are. And when we talk about somewhere you are, is it implies it has to do with geography. So the best way to show you this is let's go buy some gasoline. Now somewhere you are has to do well we see it in a lot of places on authentication but one place we see it a lot is in the credit card world. For example here I am buying gas and it wants me to enter my zip code. Hey it works! So I'm gonna put regular in here. Now the other thing to remember about somewhere you are is that this is also used by credit card companies to detect fraud. So for example, while I'm here in Houston, Texas, if someone else were trying to use this card in Chattanooga, Tennessee, that would definitely set off some alarms at the credit card company. Those are the types of authentication or really identifications that we run into. So the challenge that we start to get is that we do a lot of authenticating all over the place. And if I've got one network over here and then there's like a company and we access their data a lot for some reason or another, the hassle of authenticating from one place and then another can be a bit of a problem. So with a lot of operating systems, in fact, well, let me rephrase that, with Microsoft Windows in particular, we can actually create authentications based on trust. So here I've got three different networks. And in this particular situation, these are three different companies that access this one company's database. So what becomes interesting is that we can set up what are known as a federated trust situation. And when we say federated trust, it's basically uh, this system saying to this system, if you've got somebody you trust, then I'll trust them as well. And what we can do, this sets up in Windows fascinatingly under Active Directory, is we can set something up and we can actually establish a trust. We can connect to another Windows domain and say, this domain trusts this domain, and it can automatically create these types of federated transitive trusts. The last thing to throw in here is the idea of what we call multi-factor authentication. You would never ever use a biometric as a primary and only source of authentication. Typically what you're going to do is pretty much everything works with a username and password, uh, or it could be a PIN number. So if you're going to authenticate on a system, you're going to use a uh, fingerprint scanner and you're going to type in a username and password. You're going to type in a username and password and you're going to use a hardware token. So we're always doing the multi-factor form of authentication.